Um, well, I have to say, I walked in here this morning and I was floored. I think it was absolutely fabulous. I think this is one of the best attended meetings that I've been talking about.
California, Missouri, Michigan, and Florida. And what's really striking is more often what they said that we're more surprising by is we actually didn't find very many differences between these locations. So this is sort of a starting point. People don't get the fire. They understood what the fire risk was. They would be on board. They'd support us. They just can't, they can't possibly understand the risk. Well, they do, actually. People living in fire prone areas, if you ask them what's the fire risk, they'll be like, it's at 8, 9, or 10 on the scale of 10. How do they know? Look around you. Uh, the thing about it is risk is a complex and really subjective concept. We, we talk about risk all the time as if it's this really straightforward thing, but it's actually one of the least straightforward concepts I've run into. Um, how we calculate risk, what risk we're talking about, we have a variable. So the classic definition of risk is probability times consequences. So how you calculate the probability is going to depend upon the time frame you're thinking about. It's going to depend on the spatial extent you're thinking about. And then what's the consequence you're considering when you talk about risk? So if you have a firefighter, what, what's your fire risk this summer? If, if they're thinking, what's the probability I'm going to be in a fire this summer where there's a house threatened by fire? Well, it's really incredibly high risk, right? Because they're talking about what could be a natural spatial extent for that firefighter. Um, and living in town homes. Yet the homeowner what their fire risk is, they actually probably give a rating of four or five on a scale of one to ten, which actually in my book is incredibly high, given the fact that we're talking about a house that might burn that summer. That's an incredibly specific risk that they're talking about. If you think of the calculations of a single home burning in a given summer, it's like point zero 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 zero. So they're actually talking about or thinking about is they may be thinking about very different risks. The other part of it is it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. So you do have to see that there's a risk that you should do something. That in and of itself is not enough to make people respond. Even if you have two individuals who are looking at the exact same risk and come to the exact same conclusion about what the risk is, you know, they're both two homeowners right next door, houses identical. They both say, my risk on a scale of 1 to 10 is 6. One of them might do something and one of them might not. So why is that? A whole bunch of different characteristics. Um, one is risk attitude. Humans, we all have personalities. Some of us think it's really fun to run towards flames or to jump out flames. Other people think that's a really incredibly stupid thing to do. And that's all about the risk attitude. Some people are very risk tolerant, it's fun, and some people are very risk averse. And that's going to shape how you make your decisions. So we actually found in one study that people who were really risk averse were just choosing not to live out in the woods. They were like, man, that was a bit too scary out there, out there. that's why I chose to buy a house in town. So the people who were more risk tolerant were saying, yeah, I'm okay with it, I get all these other benefits. And that's the other dynamic going on. People will say, you know, this risk exposure is worth it because I get to see deer out my window every day. Um, it's peaceful, it's quiet, I don't hear traffic. This is, this is totally worth the chance of I might one day be affected. And just to sort of put it on more traditional grounds, every day you get in a car. Your risk of being in a car accident and of potentially dying is not negligible. It's actually really much higher than losing your house to a fire. Yet you do it every day because the convenience of that is it's all worth taking that calculated risk. And we've also found that when people choose to evacuate, some of that has to do with risk attitude. So people who tend to stay within their homes are more risk tolerant. People who are more financially risk tolerant tend to leave early, and people who are kind of more health risk tolerant, because there's different types of risk tolerant attitudes, um, they tend to be more likely to wait around to see what's going to happen, and whether or not it's necessary to evacuate. So other things to trade off for the benefits, is it worth this exposure to me? And then the individual capacity. You might want to do something, but you just don't have the money, you don't have the time, you don't have the physical ability to do it. This is the first one that I got trapped in. Both of us have to tell you fire is bad. And I had a professor question me when I put that in my dissertation and say, well, where's your evidence? Lo and behold, there is no evidence that holds up. There are no studies that show that smoking, that's the conclusion people have come to because of smoking. And most are studies where you ask them and say, what did smoking teach you? That I should be responsible when I'm in the woods. I think that's pretty good enough. The other evidence is even more clear that they have a much more sophisticated um, idea of fire is that it's very consistent across studies, focus groups, interviews, really clear that people have a pretty good, and often, we talk a lot of research, is very sophisticated you know, explanation point, understanding the fire 
in this beneficial role play. People will say, no, I get it. It's part of this area that's going to burn. It needs to burn. The factory of the pine cones won't open until it does burn. So yeah, I get it. The fire's part of this area. And it's going to happen, and it needs to happen. The other one that's probably more relevant for you folks is that very consistent across studies across the United States, 80% of the prescribed fires in accessible management schools. Right there that says that they understand that prescribed burning and fire has a role and is a tool that we can use for management. Breaks right down to roughly 30% are like, yes, go for it. And 50% are kind of like, well, it's okay. Depends where you're doing it. Depends who's doing it. Um, that sort of thing. I'll talk a little bit more about things that can influence that 50%. The other thing that comes out in those studies where they ask people about their preferences for different treatments is that no treatment is always the least good option. People want their landscape actively managed. This is probably the one I hear most. People don't take responsibility. How do we get the homeowners to take responsibility for their property? And the reality, when you go out and you talk to individual landowners, their response will be, no, I chose to look I chose to buy this land, I chose to live here, it's my responsibility to mitigate the fire risk on my property. And studies again pretty consistently show that two thirds of homeowners are engaged in some type of vegetation management on their property. Sometimes it's 80 or 90 percent. Whether or not that's sufficient management, whether or not they're doing all the activities is a question mark, but the fact that they're doing some shows that they are taking some, sense of their, some responsibility for their property. Um, but they also recognize the risk is shared. So what we're sitting here saying, how do we get this homeowner to take responsibility? They're sitting here saying, how do we get these state and federal land agencies to take responsibility for managing their land? They're sort of like, don't come tell me to manage my land if you're not managing your land as well. So they recognize that the risk is shared. And that what you do affects my risk and what I do affects yours. What do they expect of government agencies? The dominant one, take care of their land. That's their job, that's what they're supposed to be doing. Education, yeah, we like education, but it's not this generic information that there is a fire risk, that we need to do prescribed risk, it's very specific information. What is the fire risk in this area? What's the likely fire behavior? What are the weather conditions I should be paying particular attention to? On my piece of property, is the fire more likely to be coming from one area? Given that, should I be setting that area more than on this side of my property? So it's much more specific to their individual concern than this generic level of information. Um, there's also, you know, they wouldn't they would mind the health of the larger scale obstacles, that can make a big difference. They don't necessarily expect it. But when it happens, they say it makes a big difference. And generally that's the simple one is the chicken program, or a program that helps to take away the vegetation that they remove. That's usually the biggest barrier to people. In some places where you have communities where um, Either the landscape's really tough, like very steep, so it's kind of dangerous for people to live in, or they're elderly and they just don't have the physical ability, then having actual assistance removing the vegetation can also make a difference for people. But again, they don't expect it, they just appreciate it. Then there's a whole bunch of demographic stories, different groups. Um, probably the dominant one is always new people. The new people are moving to Philadelphia, they don't understand fire, and they don't get the fire risk if they're not doing anything. There's no consistent evidence that people, new people are less likely to understand the fire risk or they're less likely to be proactive. In fact, I, if, if I was going to say where the, the evidence is consistent, it's more likely to be that new people are more likely to be proactive. But I would say overall it's just not consistent across studies. More often than not, there's no significant difference. Why? Well, one is 60% of those in the United States are within the county. So those new people are new to that neighborhood, they're new to that street, they are not new to the fire risk. 20% are within the state and only 20% are from out of the state. So this assumption that everybody's new and they have nothing, doesn't have any exposure to the fire regime in their area doesn't really hold up very well. Um, and the other is confirmation bias. So people who've lived in a place for a long time have probably formed an opinion about what the problem is. Uh, we haven't had a fire in years. It's no big deal. I don't think we need to do anything about it. They keep telling us about it, but they don't pay attention to your new information because they've formed an opinion. They discount it. People who are new know they're new. And when they get information, they pay attention to it because, oh, things might be a little different here. Let's find out what it's about. So I've been to more than a few places where the person who's been the most proactive is the new person who got a brochure and looked at it and 
did look good on it and the tax in the same block. Homeowners have been there for 20 years, haven't done anything for five. Oftentimes, he actually is one person who's great to come to his face. It has nothing to do with fire. It has everything to do with concern about wind damage. Part time. We like to say the part time residents don't get the fire risk. There's no evidence that they don't get the fire risk. The evidence that they are less likely to be proactive is, is extremely mixed. Um, some studies find no difference. One or two find they're more proactive. A larger proportion find they're less proactive but it is about time and not knowledge. So it's just simply, I'm not I'm here on the weekends, I'm not gonna spend a lot of my vegetation. I'm here for months in the summer. I really don't want to deal with folks with prescribed burn. So it's more about their, the situation and time than knowledge. And that's, I think, one of the other takeaways. Do not assume that the issue is a knowledge deficit. If you just provide people with information, that's gonna solve it. There's very little evidence that the issue is a knowledge deficit. Um, experience. They just see a fire, experience the fire. Then everybody will get on board. Oh, we haven't had a fire in years, they're all apathetic. No, they just have an incredibly busy lives and there's other things that are more important on their agenda. They do not work in the fire world, they have other things that they're paying attention to. What an event will do is it bumps up fire or something to worry about into their top 10 pool of things they need to worry about. So they will pay more attention to information you get during a fire. But there's also a lot of research from natural hazards that shows that it's going to be most effective if you've been talking about it long before the fire ever happens. So it's more about, oh, this is what they were talking about. Let me pay attention to them now. So you do have their attention. Last about three to six months. And then over time, as, as one psychologist told me, we all as human beings have a finite pool of worries. You can only worry about so much. So over the course of three to six months, other worries are going to come in and shed fire to the side. So you have a window. It's not guaranteed. Some people in the event will make them be the aha moment. Next, let's do something. Actually, as many people as not will actually do the exact opposite. Ugh. I don't see what difference you can make. So why bother? The vast majority of people that actually really doesn't change their behavior all that much. And finally, the basic demographic or regional characteristics explain how people respond. Um, there's no evidence that income, education, people respond a certain way because of differences in that. Um, the only one that's fairly consistent is that women tend to have higher risk perception than men, and that's been found in tons of research, research studies. So that's not surprising. Or that there's regional differences. We don't actually find huge differences. Local context matters. That's the key. If you have something you're saying, you know, my my place is different. It might be, but it's most likely because of something very specific to your local context. Odds are pretty good that that is the relationship between the agency and the community. That's often where you see the distinction between them. Sometimes it's about fire history, which guys are that went wrong. Sometimes it's about local ecology, local building code, something else. But it's much more localized in terms of the differences you see than it is this very big regional nature. Okay, so. Hopefully go to a few bubbles there. Um, what does shape public views? Three things. Knowledge. The better people understand a practice is associated with higher acceptance of that practice and lower concern about negative outcomes. So the more they understand what you're doing and why you're trying to do it, the more exposure they have to it. This morning it was mentioned to take people out on demo programs. Great idea. The more people can see fire, understand it. Um, I was part of a TREX program last fall, which was fabulous, and the thought that ran through my mind for the entire two weeks was, if people understood the amount of thought that goes into what you do, they would not have reservations about what you're doing. If they understood the amount of planning and the care that goes into doing a prescribed burn, you would have a lot more people who would be quite comfortable with what you're doing. Ecological benefits are particularly important. They're much more important to people than consideration about fire risk reduction. And even when there's concerns about negative outcomes with prescribed fire, concern about smoke, concern about escape, do matter. But as people learn more about the ecological benefits of a prescribed fire, those concerns decrease. So even a father with a child with asthma made a statement in a focus group saying, you know, as I learn more about the ecological benefits, I think the concern's okay, and then I need to just deal with it. And that's kind of pissing me off, because I don't want to deal with it. But I get what you're doing. And as I sort of said a moment ago, the reasons and the amount of planning you go into can influence acceptance when they really understand the amount of work that you're doing that makes a difference. And whether or not local knowledge and context are taken into account can influence response. And 
and all of this kind of is partly related to the other variable I'm getting in myself, which is trust. Um, local context, knowledge that tells them you know what you're doing, you know the area. But this is an example of sort of how to understand and accept this. This is a study um, in Massachusetts, outside of Mount Sanders State Forest. Um, and their knowledge was a significant predictor of support for sky burning. Those with more knowledge were less likely to think it was dangerous to use, to have to be concerned about its use in their homes. That's something that people are more comfortable with fire being used away from homes. But there's also a lot of places I can point you to where they burn right around the homes and people are okay with it. Um, and they're less concerned about smoke aesthetics and effects on wildlife and wildlife habitat. My dissertation was in kind of Nevada, and I had pretty identical results to this. Two opposite sides of the country, two different ecosystems, pretty identical results. Um, other studies, one that was California, Michigan, Missouri, and Florida, in two of the states, California and Michigan, believes that prescribed fire improves wildlife conditions, has a positive effect on acceptance. In Oregon, Oregon study found that smoke was more acceptable if it helped forest health. And a Washington study, which is the one with that father and the kid with asthma, um, as they learned more about the beneficial effects of, of um, prescribed burning, they became more okay with smoke and prescribed fire. So there are two factors that do influence prescribed fire specific to it. Yes, concern about escape does shape acceptance. The more people are concerned about escape, the lower their acceptance levels are going to be. Knowledge, understanding of practice, and thought and planning that goes into it can decrease that concern. The other thing to think about comes from focus groups that we did in um, five places out west. And in all of them, we said, how would you feel if they started doing more prescribed burning? And usually the answer was, that's a terrible idea. Um, why? Well, they can't control them now, can you say? Then really interested, somebody in that group would say, but I think they do. I think we just figured out the ones that go wrong. And then the group would have this discussion. And they start going, you know, now that I think about it, that's probably right. I don't just hear about the ones that go wrong. We don't hear about the ones that go right. And by the end of this conversation in the group, they're all like, yeah, maybe I should be doing more prescribed burning. But you need to tell us more about the ones that go right. So we are not making this assumption that they all go wrong. And when you look at the statements they made in the end, 5% um, escape or even a 10% escape rate, they're comfortable with. So, yes, smoke does matter, it is significant, but the important point is what it's a problem for is health. It is not an aesthetics issue, it is not a recreation issue. In, in the southeast, in some places, it is an issue for travel, but really, fundamentally, it's a health issue. A third of households in the United States have someone in them who has a health issue that's affected by smoke. So that is not minor. For these people, smoke is incredibly important. It's incredibly important to them. And they are going to come talk to you about it because it is their health and the health of a loved one that's at risk. Other two thirds, it's a nuisance. It's not that big a deal. For even people who have a health issue, they do understand that there's trade offs. They do understand they might need to deal with smoke at some level. And they are willing to tolerate some smoke now if they feel like there's less smoke in the future. Um, and they just want warning, so they can make arrangements. So we won't have our family picnic that weekend, or so if they're in really bad shape, we'll go out of town and visit our relatives next day, in the next state. So they just want warning to make arrangements. Uh, we did dinner focus groups in Flagstaff a couple of years ago. They had a fire, a slight fire that started that summer. They had six or seven managed burns that had been going on. This is community really used to it. They expected more smoke in the future. And when we asked if they wanted more or less or about the same, they were, the majority said they wanted more. So even if they really affected by smoke, the only comment they said was, could you just give us a break if you're doing this? <laughs> so this is an example of sort of that one third. This is from um, in a survey we did after people had toured treatment sites in California. We said, how would, what's your preference for treatments? And then how important were these factors? So the lower the bar, the more important factors. So unsurprisingly, concern about forest health and reducing fire hazard were the key variables shaping their preference for treatments. Then you get things like concern about improving wildlife habitat, is it cost effectiveness, do you have an 
control the results start being coming to play. We still think acid smoke is being an important variable. Where is smoke? Least important. The least important consideration is a preference for different practices. Now the manager I worked with looked at this graph and just told me it's your dad is wrong. I don't get yelled at. He said it's a recreational opportunity. I don't get yelled at because of wildlife habitat. I get yelled at because of smoke. This graph is a mean. So this is the average response. If you actually look at the distribution of responses, it was very bimodal. 30% said it was a very important consideration, and two-thirds said it was not at all important. So the second variable, trust. Um, do they trust? Trust in the agency matters. It's sort of a starting point, but the really critical one is, do we trust the people who are implementing this practice? Do they know what they're doing? If they trust the people who are implementing it, then treatments are generally acceptable. Um, if they're done by knowledgeable people, they know what they're doing, they're competent. Preferably locals, familiar with the area. So locals is a proxy for they understand the area, they understand the conditions, they understand that there's a wind change every day. And I like to rephrase this to how I hear people talk about it, because they don't often talk about trust. What they talk about is respect. They are very willing to respect the expertise of what you do. You don't fire people, you know what you're doing, you've got the training on this. I do not want to or desire to tell you how to do your job. But I do want to know what you're doing and why you're doing it and be informed and to know that you understand my concerns and that you're taking them into account. So it's kind of a mutual respect thing. They're like, I respect your expertise, but I want you to respect that I need to know what you're doing and that I have some concerns um, and I want to know they're getting taken into account. They don't require that you like change. They don't require that you have no smoke or that you guarantee there's no escape. They just want to know that you are trying your best to minimize those impacts. This is the third one, interactive communication. Most effective ways to change behavior, change social norms. Why? Um, well, one of the best way to improve in understanding, particularly with a really complex topic, people can ask questions, they can clarify things. Oh, I can still have pretty good defensible space even if I don't take the tree right next to my house that my grandmother planted out, which I'm not doing. Um, you can clarify your misperception. Oh, they totally get the fire risk. They just think that it's going to damage the habitat for this bird that they like. So it allows that exchange that helps really clarify things and find out what they care about. And it builds trust. They get to know the person, get to know that they know what they're doing, get to know that they care and they have good reasons for what they're doing, sort of removes the horns from their head, as I like to think about it. Um, so they become more accepting of what you're doing. More times than not, I've heard a variant of, you know, they want us to do more prescribed burning, and then the local fire manager, you know, he came to a meeting, and I was talking to him, and I was talking, you know, I bumped into him a couple of times in grocery stores, you know, I think he's actually a really smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He really cares about the land. And I'm still kind of a little nervous about prescribed burning, but I get what they're doing, and I'm okay with it now. So I've heard a variant of that in many forms. The other point is that transparency is a shorthand for trust. So oftentimes you may not have that chance to really build that relationship with people that leads to trust. And so what people have is transparency is their shorthand for saying, I think I can trust this person because they're giving me a straight excuse. They're not going to do their own rounds. They're not talking down to me. They're not sort of, you know, condescending and thinking I can't handle it. They're just telling me how it is, and therefore I can trust them. So this is kind of a model that you might think of used, to, you used to think about this. We tend to sort of simplify it to fire risk acceptance. Yeah, necessary, not, not, not sufficient. Knowledge, understanding, ecological benefits, particularly important. Risk reduction is going to be important to some people. Cost effectiveness, there's some indication that that matters to people. Concerns, prescribed fire, um, escape smoke, both negative, but they can be moderated with knowledge and understanding. The other thing to note here is that a lot of concerns that we often have raised as reasons why people might not support practice, like aesthetics or wildlife, as often as not in studies, it's associated with why they support the practice as why they don't support it. So oftentimes, benefits to wildlife habitat, aesthetic improvement is why you have increased support than why you have less support. Trust, do you trust these people? Are they credible? Are they competent? Do they know what they're doing? 
How do you communicate with them? Is it interactive? Do you have a chance for that exchange? Are they being transparent? That can affect both the knowledge and that can affect your trust. Other factors that can influence response is backing out of the 2010 synthesis. We followed up and did another one in 2015, basically found completely supported what I just told you. Two other factors that start coming out as really important. Place attachment, that's part of that local benefit. People care about where they live. That's why they pay attention to whether or not you understand the local. Um, that matters to people, and if you don't take that into account, they probably aren't gonna pay attention to what you're doing. Um, so whether or not that local context and knowledge are taken into account. It can influence the use of fire management. Um, studies from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US all have a similar finding of responses to fighting the fire that did not use local resources, that did not take local knowledge into account, were all judged poorly by the locals. When they took local resources into account, when they took local knowledge into account, they were much more likely to have a fire outcome where even if they had bad things, like they lost houses, people were not unhappy with how the fire was managed. So that can really affect how people think the fire was managed not take the, the, that local knowledge and resources into account. Um, it affects the community, agency community act, interactions and how they interpret information. So if the information is not relevant to my situation, my condition, if those trees are not the trees that I see in my landscape, I'm not going to pay attention to this information because it's probably really not relevant to me. Social interactions and networks are really important. Um, they really facilitate learning and building capacity. That's actually part of what the fire learning network, that's part of what it did. It helped build these networks amongst all sorts of prescribed fire managers. Well, the same applies in communities. So when you facilitate those networks, you facilitate learning. And one study in Australia, I think, did a really nice job of explaining how that works. Um, that was a program to help a neighborhood become fire ready. And they basically found that the social networks that developed through the training led to some shared goals and shared sense of community, and that the shared sense of community made people in turn um, had more sense of shared responsibility, I have to do my part too, more motivation to prepare, um, and they concluded that basically facilitating a social network development is probably the most efficient way agencies can encourage preparedness. Much more than that information is getting those networks on board. Useful to recognize that networks can be diffused or Focus. So we tend to think the network is like something that's kind of consolidated. We tend to talk about the public in terms of the community, the community like a neighborhood or a street where they're all near each other and they can all talk to each other. Yeah, that, that matters. But you can also have a very diffuse network. Um, you guys are actually finding a good example of a diffuse network. You don't see each other every day, but you know how to call each other up if you need that information. Plenty of communities in the U.S. where people have moved, moved out to rural areas because they do not want to talk to their neighbors. That doesn't mean they don't have an information exchange network that is there when people are in trouble. So they have a network that's like, yeah, we're, we all have each other's phone numbers. We all will call each other and help each other out when we need it, but otherwise we leave each other alone. So you still have a network, it's just not that clear that it exists. So there's a lot we know from social marketing. Um, you can imagine that in research that has gone into figuring out how to get people not drive drunk, how to not spill it out, sort of thing. Um, and I think that's kind of the key takeaways from that. And the other thing is, this is the GTR that you can get from what at that point was North Central Research Station um, that sort of pulls it all together and talks about it applied to working with homeowners in relation to fire. But sort of the key takeaways, which Aaron was talking about this morning, is you really need to understand your audience. Um, so you can deal with your, their misconceptions, your misconceptions about what the issue is for them. They can deal with their misconceptions about what the issue is, you know, really is. You can tailor information for them for what they really care about. If they don't care about the fire risk, but they care about the ecological benefits, you can tailor it for that. You can figure out what they care about, what they already know, and build from there. You can also identify the barriers and resource limitations specific to that area. So a lot of, many, many times, it has nothing to do with knowledge it's just about the time, money, visibility, that sort of thing. This is how we tend to like to think of it, because it's really nice and easy, and oh, it's the world would be nice if it worked this way. Um, if we just give them information, the knowledge deficit issue, they'll change their behavior. That's not how it works. Providing information can increase awareness, raise awareness, 
does not lead to any good change. What about mass media? Very appealing, gets a lot of people, relatively cost effective. Oh, it's great for raising awareness. It can be very effective for a very simple behavior change, such as Smokey Bear. Don't you go start setting a fire? Very simple message. But when you get to the more complicated um, social norm or behavior change, like prescribed burning, it does, it's not going to get you there. It's too complicated. There's too many questions. The one exception is brochures. They form a basis of information that's enough information so that when somebody does decide they want to do something, they can then reference the brochure and say, oh, okay, here's my list of things I need to do. So it's part of a behavior change, but in and of itself, they won't do it. What does lead to behavior change, I've already pretty much told you, is that interactive communication. Use all the good reasons. You know, I sort of pointed out that people care much more about technological benefits than fire risk. A lot of people at defensible space for reasons that have nothing whatsoever to do with fire. They have it for wind damage, they have it for recreation values in Florida, they don't want, they want to be able to be safe from the ground. Um, so use all the good reasons. Don't assume that people need to have a behavior for the reason that you care about. Find out what they care about and use that reason. Um, use all the information sources, delivery stream all the time. No one method is going to be better than another. Social media is useful for some people, not for others. Use them all. Um, use all the outlets. People are going to trust different source information sources. Just make sure you have um, a consistent message. So to summarize, it's largely acceptable management tool. Building understanding and trust for interactive communication is the key to increasing that acceptance. Um, continually assess your mission when you have in public. Don't assume you know what the issues are with people. Go out and talk, listen, ask questions. That can get you a long ways down the road. Account for local knowledge, context, interaction with social networks help change behavior. Um, I will say one thing about um, language. Don't get too caught up in language. There is no right terminology for everybody. Prescribed fire is going to work for some people. Control burn is going to work for other people. Manage fire will work with others. Pay attention to who you're talking to, see what they respond to. Prescribed fire may not make them comfortable, but if they don't understand, it's a great opportunity for you to help explain it. So it's very useful to have studies that go out and look at language and how people respond, but remember that they're just seeing how people respond to people. It's not a given that that's how you talk to them. There is, we get too hung up on having the right word without the magic figure. Just go out and explain what you're doing and why you're doing. And that's kind of where I end up, which is on focus groups that we did. Um, we asked people at the end. They didn't know why they were there. We said, okay, the Forest Service funded you, uh, funded this project. We want to hear all the people who don't want to use the advice. So this is three focus groups in five different places. The dominant piece of advice is could you please tell us who you are, what you do, and why you do it. We realized in this discussion we really don't know, and we really actually would like to know. And it also kind of summarizes that understanding and trust. Tell us who you are, what you do, and why you're doing it. That's all people want to know. And yes, Forest Service, but there isn't a lot of evidence that people distinguish between government agencies. So there's nothing I've said today that I feel is unique to a agency. <coughs> then the next part was thank you so much for what you do, and thank you for asking us what we think. You know, we actually really care about the land, and we really appreciate all the work you're doing. We just don't have time to come tell you about it. And we really don't have time to come and tell you what we think and what we want. So we really appreciate the fact you made the effort to come out here and ask us. Please make your decisions based on science. Please listen to local views. And that they were making a point of not just the agency people, the local people, but the local agency staff. And these are pictures of two successful programs. Um, the one is with a big fire that was prescribed for in Columbia, Ridge, Nevada. Those are those little glass of light or million plus dollar houses. No one in that town complained about that work. And I hope it's